Continue to make progress since uh, I spoke to you on Friday. We have moved thousands of people each day via U.S. military aircraft and civilian charter flights. A little over 30 hours, in a little over 30 hours this weekend, we've evacuated an extraordinary number of people, as I will detail in a minute, about 11,000 individuals. That number will change day to day as the air and ground operations in Kabul vary. Our first priority in Kabul is getting American citizens out of the country as quickly and as safely as possible. At my direction, the State Department continues to reach out to the remaining Americans we have identified by phone, email, and other means to ascertain their whereabouts and their plans. We're executing a plan to move groups of these Americans to safety and to safely and effectively move them to the airport compound. For security reasons, I'm not going to go into the detail of what these plans entail. But I will say again today that I have said before, any American who wants to get home will get home. We've also been evacuating the citizens of our NATO allies and our partners, including their diplomats, their embassy staff, who remain in Afghanistan, and to get them back to their homes as well. And uh, as we do this, we're also working to move our Afghan allies, who stood with us side by side, and other vulnerable Afghans, such as women leaders and journalists, out of the country. As of this morning, we have evacuated nearly 28,000 people since August the 14th on both U.S. and coalition aircraft, including civilian charters, bringing the total number of people we've evacuated since July to approximately 33,000 persons. In one 24-hour period this weekend, 23 U.S. military flights including 14 C-17s, nine C-130 flights, left Kabul carrying 3,900 passengers. We show no reason why this temple will not be kept up. During the same period, our military facilitated another 35 charter flights, carrying an additional 4,000 evacuees to other countries that are taking, that are taking them out. Altogether, we lifted approximately 11,000 people out of Kabul in less than 36 hours. It's an incredible operation. Let me be clear. The evacuation of thousands of people from Kabul is going to be hard and painful no matter when it started, when we began. It would have been true if we had started a month ago or a month from now. There is no way to evacuate this many people without pain and loss of heartbreaking images you see on television. It's just a fact. My heart aches for those, things, those people you see. We are proving that we can move those thousands of people a day out of Kabul. We're bringing our citizens, NATO allies, Afghanis who in fact has helped us in the war effort. But we have a long way to go, and a lot could still go wrong. But to move out 30,000 people in just over a week, that's a great testament to the men and women on the ground in Kabul and our armed services. It also reflects a tireless diplomatic effort. In order to keep a steady flow of planes taking off from Kabul and maximize our evacuation capacity, we have quickly stood up an unprecedented global effort and established a series of processing stations in third countries. In short, we're not flying them directly to the country, we're flying to these processing stations, where we're working with more than two dozen countries across four continents. I've secured agreements, we've secured agreements with the Gulf excuse me, across the Gulf, in Central Asia, and in Europe, including processing centers in Qatar, Germany, Kuwait, Spain, and elsewhere. It allows us to sort and process these evacuees. This transit, these transit centers provide a safe place for the SIV applicants and other vulnerable Afghanis and their families to complete their paperwork while we conduct security screenings and background checks before they continue on to their final destination in the United States or in another country, one of our NATO allies as well. And so from Asia to Africa, from Europe to Western, the Western Hemisphere, nations are making generous offers to support resettlement efforts. And I've been in personal contact with the leaders of many countries, including Qatar, Germany, Spain, Italy, the UAE, and others. They're making vital contributions to thank them for their support and to discuss how we can continue to coordinate our efforts in Afghanistan moving forward is the reason why I continue in contact with them. 
And I want to again thank all of our partners for their continue, continuing to stand together. We've also activated the first stage of what's referred to as the Civil Reserve Air Fleet to help with the onward movement of evacuees from these transit centers. Our military aircraft and others will get them to these centers, but then we're going to get the Civil Reserve Fleet. It's a program that's designed, was designed in the wake of the Berlin airlift after World War II to use commercial aircraft to augment our airlift capacity. This is a voluntary program for our commercial airlines. And we're grateful for those airlines and the U.S. carriers who are supporting us. This effort will only use three or four planes from each of the major carriers, vast fleets of aircraft. So there should be no effect or a minimal effect on commercial air travel. And we'll stay in close coordination with our partners to mitigate any impact. These Civil Reserve flights will be helping facilitate the safe movement of people from staging locations and transit centers like Qatar or Germany, to the United States or to a third country. None of them will be landing in Kabul. Now, the American aircraft as part of this will not be going to any country but the United States. As this uh, effort unfolds, I want to be clear about three things. One, planes taking off from Kabul are not flying directly to the United States. They're landing at U.S. military bases and transit centers around the world. Number two, at these sites where they're landing, we are conducting thorough scrutiny, security screening for everyone who is not a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent residence. Anyone arriving in the United States will have undergone a background check. Number three, once screened and cleared, we will welcome these Afghans who helped us in the war effort over the last 20 years to their new home in the United States of America, because that's who we are. That's what America is. You know, I've been touched by the outpouring of support that we've seen from communities, organizations across America, mobilizing to support these efforts. So many of these Afghans stood bravely by U.S. troops in Afghanistan. And now, the United States, including veterans groups, refugee settlement agencies, religious organizations, and so many others, are standing with our Afghan allies. It exemplifies the best of America. And I want to say again just how difficult this mission is and how dangerous it po the dangers it poses to our troops on the ground. The security environment is changing rapidly. There are civilians crowded at the airport, although we've cleared thousands of them. We know that terrorists may seek to exploit the situation and target innocent Afghans or American troops. They're maintaining constant vigilance to mob we're maintaining the constant business to monitor and disrupt threats of, from any source, including the likely source being ISIS, ISIS-K, the Afghan affiliate referred to as ISIS-K. But we're under no illusions about the threat. I said on Friday, ISIS-K is a sworn enemy of the Taliban, and they have a history of fighting one another. But every day we have troops on the ground. These troops and innocent civilians at the airport face the risk of attack from ISIS-K from a distance, even though we're moving back the perimeter significantly. We're working hard and as fast as we can to get people out. That's our mission. That's our goal. And our determination to get every American citizen home and to evacuate our Afghan allies is unwavering. We continue to see not only enormous, the enormous scope and scale of the effort, we will see the individual lives that are affected, the families that are desperate to get home to their loved ones in America, the communities of veterans who have mobilized to try to help their former interpreters get to safety, the frightened Afghans who aren't sure what to do. To state the obvious, it's heartbreaking. We're all seeing it. We see it. We feel it. You can't look at it and not feel it. Nothing about this effort is easy. But the women and men of the United States Armed Forces are acting bravely and with professionalism and with a basic human compassion. compassion. I want to offer my profound thanks to our service members on the ground in Kabul and to all those at U.S. bases around the world who are welcoming and caring, and caring for these evacuees.